in Cracknell. I'm advocacy officer at Shefford and Rotherham Wildlife Trust. Um, you can contact me on the email address there uh, if you, you'd like to get in touch about this issue or any other issues for wildlife. Um, I'm just going to give you a very basic kind of brief introduction to the Action for Insects campaign. Um, some of the initial uh, matter will I'm sure be, be covered by uh, Dave in, in more detail, but just to kind of summarise what the campaign is, what it's about and what Oh, Ian, you've, you've muted. <laughs> Sorry, it's happened again, Ian. Okay. Thank you. What is the Action for Insects campaign about? Um, it's a national campaign um, run by the majority of the wildlife trusts, if not all of them, uh, in response to the catastrophic decline of insect populations. Um, and there's a couple of main kind of overarching asks, which are, reducing pesticide use where we live, work and farm, and, and trying to urge the government to set compulsory and ambitious pesticide reduction targets. We're also pushing for a nature recovery network to be created, um, which will help insect friendly habitats in gardens, towns, cities and countryside, and secure more bigger, better protected and better connected wildlife rich places through the New Environment Act. Um, so that's a very simple kind of the latter part of that is a, is a very simple understanding of what a, a nature recovery network is. And that's the bit that you can really help with by taking actions in your own gardens. Um, you know, even adding things like a bug hotel contributes to that. But if you've got more space in your garden, you can make it go wilder or you can you can target certain insects by planting pollinator friendly flowers and this kind of thing, then that will help your neighbours do the same thing and um, we'll, we'll create bigger habitats and, and that goes up as the scale of the, the habitat increases. Um, so why do we need action for insects? Well, insects are amazing animals and they're hugely important for a healthy ecosystem. Um, they pollinate three quarters of all our food crops. So insects are really important for us. Um, it's not just about insects. Um, they're also very important as a food matter for other animals as well. So if you like wildlife, and I imagine there's a, uh, you know, someone following this, this talk and attending this talk, you do, you know, it, it's insects are really important to almost all other wildlife as food. 41% um, of insect species are at risk of extinction and they're declining up to eight times faster than larger animals. So they're really, really uh, feeling the pressure um, of, of, of vet for various reasons. Loss of habitat, pesticide use, they're the biggest impacts. There are other factors, uh, but they're the two, and they're the, they're the two main ones that we're focusing on. So here are some quick actions you can take. These are things that you can do to help straight away. So you can sign up for our Action for Insects campaign. Uh, there's a link there. It's just forward slash AFI from our usual website address um, and you get a free action for insects guide um, and we can stay in touch with you and send you more information on things that you can do to help insects. You can join over a hundred thousand people who signed our petition asking the Prime Minister to ban neonicot neonicotinoid insecticides, it's such a mouthful that, um, so neonics is what we call them for short. Um, they're a type of um, insecticide that were actually banned by the EU and uh, Von sort of banned, um, I, I th think before that, I can't quite remember, but banned by the government. Uh, and they said that they, they, would, they would never be used. And they've rolled back on that um, recently um, to allow them to be used for sugar beet. And what happened was uh, we had a very cold snap, as you might remember, um, earlier in the year. And that meant that they didn't need to be used. So uh, insects got a reprieve from their use, but we're really concerned about the rollback on these insecticides being used. Um, it is a real worry because it's just the start, isn't it? If they start doing that with this uh, issue, then what else might they allow to be used? They're, they're, they're terrible. They're really, really bad for our insects. So please, if you haven't already, I do urge you to sign that petition. Um, and also we have another campaign around uh, peat-free compost. So I'm sure many of you uh, opt to use peat-free compost. Um, if you don't, please, please do. Our peatlands are hugely important for insects and other animals. Lots of 
very rare uh, species, um, you know, a, a, a very uh, suited to that environment. And, and so when peat's taken out of it, you know, it's massively damaging. So um, we've got a petition to the government to ban all peat-based products from sale. That's what we'd like to see happen to protect those habitats. So there's a couple of things you can do there uh, by signing that petition. But also when you go to the supermarket or your garden centre or where you get your garden supplies, make sure you get peat free, but also ask them to stock it if they don't and ask them to stop stocking peat products. Tell them how important this is to you. Um, what can you do in the longer term? We can allow some of your areas in your garden to grow a bit wilder, get, allow your grass to grow a bit longer, especially in these months when the insects you know, start to be around a lot more. Um, if you don't have a garden, you can add a window box or a bug hotel on a, a, a ledge or the outside of your, your building. Um, plant native pollinator friendly flowers and fruit trees and consider adding a pond. That's probably one of the best things you can do if you've got a garden to attract wildlife. And there's a link there for some actions um, that you can take with some really good guidance actually on how to do that. Some of them quite DIY, how to, how to make these things yourself. Um, and then look for insects in your garden on walks and then you can add the records of what you see to our database. Um, and that will really help us to see where these species are doing well or perhaps where they're not doing so well and it'll add to the na national picture as well. So uh, if, if, you, if you use that URL um, and go onto our website there's a system there where you can you can log any wildlife sighting if you see a bird or anything but you can you can use this for insects it's uh, it, it's a really good way for us to sort of know what's out there and, and to see more records being submitted as well because insects are really underreported. Um, and then kind of like to end with just a, 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 another thing that you can do, which is um, I'm sure many of you are members, but if you're not, I, I would urge you to become a member of the trust as well. Um, the, re the reasons are that you will help us to campaign on key issues like this, action for insects, you, you add to our voice. Um, you help us improve habitats on our nature reserves and elsewhere across Sheffield and Rotherham. Um, help us to raise concerns from local people um, who are concerned about threats to habitats or wildlife. Um, protect important habitats from the threat of development um, and help communities to improve their local green spaces for wildlife. We do all of that and much more. Um, individual memberships, just £2.50 a month. It starts from that and there's other membership options. People are often quite surprised how, how little that is and quite happy to contribute that. I understand it's not easy for everyone, um, but um, if that is something that you're able to do, um, yeah, please do because it will really help us and it will really help wildlife. And I'm sure that's why so many of you are, are here on this talk today. Um, Thanks very much. That's the that's the website for the Action for Insects campaign. Um, so do have a look at that and, and sign up. Um, and uh, if you've got any questions, then please put them in the chat and uh, I'll do my best to answer those at the end. But thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, really informative and interesting. And um, yeah, I'm sure loads of people will sign up for the Action for Insects campaign. Thank you for that. Um, so now we're going to pass over to Professor Dave Golson. He is the Professor of Biology at the University of Sussex um, for his talk entitled The Garden Jungle Saving Our Insects. So Dave, if you'd like to share your screen. And uh, just let you know you're still on mute. Yeah, we can see that, but um, you're still on mute if, uh, if you can unmute yourself. Got there in the end. Sorry about that. It's I, I made the foolish mistake of sharing my screen before I unmuted and then, then the unmute button disappears. OK, let me just get this to full screen and we'll be good to go. You'd think I've done enough talks by now that I wouldn't uh, wouldn't make mistakes, but there you go. Okay, thank you everyone uh, for coming. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so it's my pleasure today to talk about insects, more about insects. Ian's given you the, the short version. Now I'm gonna give you the, the longer version of events. Um, so I've, I've been interested in insects all my life. Um, and I have no idea why. It's funny, isn't it? I, some kids are just just um, love nature and, and wildlife um, from an early age. And I, I was one of those kids. I uh, when I was one of my earliest memories is when I was about six or seven years old. And I um, I found this yellow 
and black cutting. Um, feeding on some weeds on the edge of the school playground. And um, I collected them up and put them in my lunchbox and, and took them home and reared them up. And eventually they turned into these beautiful um, scarlet and black moths, which probably some of you will recognize as being cinnabar moths. Um, I, but I just thought that was magic. I was completely hooked. And um, I've, been, I've been lucky enough to make a career in studying insects. My focus these days is mainly on, on bumblebees, but I dabble still with butterflies and beetles and all sorts of other things. Anyway, um, I think actually many of us, as I say, have this go through this bug phase. This is my uh, youngest son, Seth, with his pet cockchafer, Colin. Um, and Seth's got a windowsill covered in jam jars full of insects of various types and so on. And I just hope he never grows out of it. But the sad truth is that most people do. And by the time they're um, teenagers or adults, most people's reaction to anything that buzzes near them is to, is to flap at it in fright or anger or something. They think it's going to bite them, sting them, give them a disease. I'm not entirely sure. But uh, um, uh, so my, my kind of mission in life is to persuade people to love insects. Um, or if that's too much for some people to or well, could I just remind everyone to uh, uh, mute yourself if you're um, if you're not me in fact uh, for the moment um, where was I um, yeah so most so so I, I try and persuade people to love more at least um, respect insects for for what they do because they're enormously important but before I talk more about insects let me let me wander off onto bigger things just for a, for a second. Bear with me. This is kind of the scene. Um, the, this is obviously our planet. This, and it's, if you stop to think about it, it's an extraordinary thing. Um, it's, it's, it's a rock hurtling through space with a crust of life clinging to its surface. It's completely unique. There can't be anything else like it in the universe. Maybe life elsewhere, but... Um, uh, for all practical intents and purposes, we're alone uh, on our little planet. Uh, there are, so far we've named 1.5 million species of animal and plant, and it's thought there might be as many as 5 million, so the majority haven't even been named yet. It's an extraordinary thing, we're incredibly lucky to have inherited this world. Um, gives us everything we need, uh, and so of course we should be looking after it better than we are. Um, we're making a real mess of our beautiful planet. And we're mostly aware of these issues to some extent, at least probably, I guess, everyone is aware of climate change these days, which gets the headlines. But it's just one of a whole bunch of interacting problems that we've created for our planet. Things like soil erosion, pollution of rivers and seas and the air and soils with pesticides, fertilizers, plastics, heavy metals deforestation, over-harvesting of the fish, and so on and so on. Um, my real focus is on biodiversity loss, and most scientists agree that we're now in the midst of the sixth mass extinction event. Um, so there have been five previous times in Earth's history when, when large numbers of species have gone extinct. Um, but every previous event was caused by something natural. Um, the last one, of course, was the dinosaurs being wiped out 65 million years ago by the meteor. Um, but this time, is, it's a unique mass extinction event because it's been caused by a species on the planet, us, of course. Uh, now, when you start talking about extinctions, people tend to think of big charismatic animals, um, tigers, giant pandas, polar bears, or whatever. They don't usually think immediately of of insects and, and until quite recently, the decline of insects had, had got very little attention, certainly compared to other creatures. And it wasn't until I think 2017 that people started to sit up and take notice that there was something going on. And it was sparked at least in part by um, publication of a study from Germany, which was based on data collected by a whole army of, of insect enthusiasts who had run malaise traps. That's a, a malaise trap, top right there. It looks like a sort of partly put up tent. And it catches flying insects. And what this chart shows you is the 
the daily weight of insects caught per trap and how it changed from 1989 to 2016. So it's a, a, a 26-year period. And you can see it fell. Um, the, the, the average number, uh, weight of insects caught fell by 76% in 26 years. So apparently three quarters of the insects in Germany somehow vanished in, in you know, a, a fraction of a human lifetime. Um, and this got covered by newspapers around the world and, and, and got people discussing, you know, was there something weird happening in Germany or is this, is this happening everywhere? And, you know, how long has it been going on? Uh, how bad is it? Um, and well, all the evidence we have suggests that it isn't just Germany. Uh, there are other studies of different insect groups, um, some from the UK. Uh, so in the UK, we have, we have a really good monitoring scheme for our butterflies which has been run since the 1970s. And this just shows you two kind of indices of abundance. Uh, the top one is for the kind of common butterflies, the everyday butterflies we see in our gardens, uh, which are down 46% since 1976. Um, and the bottom one is the, is the kind of rarities, the habitat specialists, which are down by a, a really alarming 77% since 1976. Um, so, so it seems that we're losing our, our insects too. There are lots of other lines of evidence. I'll give you one more. I don't want to depress you too much. Um, so let's just look at one species, one of my favorites, actually. I mentioned that I, I, my speciality is, is studying bumblebees. Um, and this is, this is a beauty. This is the great yellow bumblebee, um, Bombus distinguendus. Um, and the map shows you its distribution in the first half of the 20th century. It was always a, more common in the, in the north, but it was found all over, all over Britain, scattered about. Um, but as, as time went on, it's, it's disappeared. Um, and today it's extinct in England and Wales, and you've got quite a drive on your hands if you want to go and see one. Um, and it's, it's not alone. I haven't picked a worst case scenario by any means. I could show you many other species that have done similar things. Some have gone extinct completely in, in Britain. But most of this is really not, people don't tend to notice that the average person in the street has no idea that insects are, are, have disappeared. Um, except for one thing, and, and I think as soon as you see this picture, you'll know where I'm going here. Um, there's this really interesting phenomenon that, that most people over a certain age, and I'm not quite sure exactly what that age is, can remember a time when if you drove in the summer for any length of time, you had to stop every couple of hours to, to scrub the, the windscreen because it was covered in these poor splatted insects that you'd hit. Um, but that just doesn't happen anymore. You can drive... Um, huge distances on a beautiful sunny day in the middle of summer. And I've done this in, in France as well as in the UK. And you just, you might get one or two insects, but you never really have to stop to clean them off. Um, when did this, when did it change? I, I'm not really sure. Different people have slightly different version of events, but I'm pretty sure this was still happening in the late seventies and early eighties, but sometime between then and now it stopped. And all of this should really worry us because, because as I've already said, insects are hugely important. Um, this, that's, it's been put quite nicely uh, by a guy called Ed Wilson, who's a, a moderately famous American scientist. He's a, an ant specialist, actually, um, now well into his 90s. But he once said, um, I won't read it all, but he basically said if, if people were to somehow miraculously disappear from the planet, uh, that it would do very nicely without us. Um, uh, but if the insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos, was how he put it. And I, I want to explain why um, he said that. So, well, firstly, insects are the majority of biodiversity. Um, I mentioned earlier that we've named one and a half million species so far on the planet. Well, 1.1 million of those are different types of of insects. Um, and I also mentioned that there are thought to be several million uh, species that we've yet to identify. Well, most of those are thought to be insects. Um, so they are biodiversity, or at least they are most of it. 
And of course, then, as Ian mentioned, they're also food for a large proportion of the remaining creatures, the ones we do tend to pay more attention to, things like birds and the like. Um, so many birds feed on insects. Bats, of course, feed on insects. Lots of freshwater fish, trout and salmon and so on feed on insects, as do uh, lizards, frogs, toads, newts, all sorts of things. There wouldn't be much left if we got rid of the insects and everything that ate insects. Um, uh, so just imagine you're a, a, one of these beautiful bee eaters uh, living in Germany. Three quarters of your insect of your food supply has, has seemingly vanished in the last 26 years, which is obviously going to have big impacts. But then insects do lots of other things that are really important too. They're not just um, good for food. They are biocontrol agents. They help to control crop pests. Uh, they're, they're recyclers of all sorts of organic materials from dung to dead bodies to trees, leaves, uh, all sorts of things. They help to recycle and break, break them down to release the nutrients. Um, they, they help to keep the soil healthy. They distribute seeds, you name it, they do it. They're involved in pretty much everything you can imagine. And most of this is done without any kind of recognition really from people at all. We're blithely unaware of this kind of myriad of tiny little creatures going about doing important jobs all around us. So I thought I'd just, just zoom in, focus in on a couple of the, the kind of um, unrecognized heroes of the insect world, if you like, um, starting with this rather handsome little beast. Um, this is a type of lacewing larvae. Um, it's fairly common in Britain. Um, it's quite small though, so you may well have never noticed one. It's only a few millimeters long. Um, these are voracious predators of aphids, so they're really important in helping to control crop pests. Um, they have these big jaws, you can see these curved jaws that they stab into the aphid, and they're, they're hollow and they, they're like hypodermic syringes. They suck the juice out of the aphid until it's just a husk. And then this particular species, um, uh, rather than discarding the husk, sticks it on its back so that it ends up wearing this kind of crazy wig made out of dried aphids, which um, we have no idea why it does it. I, I, it's thought to be maybe some kind of camouflage, um, but an intriguing little, little beast and very important. And then there's the earwig, a much more familiar insect to everybody, but hardly anybody really likes earwigs. There is no earwig preservation society, sadly. There should be, I think, um, because actually earwigs are, are really important, but they used to be thought to be pests. Um, they do nibble blossom on fruit trees a little bit, and sometimes they'll nibble on a bruised strawberry in your fruit patch, um, but the damage they do is, is negligible, really. Um, and what wasn't recognized until quite recently was that they're, um, they're actually mainly predators, again, of, of pests. And in a fruit orchard, they do a fantastic job of eating um, aphids and whatnot off the leaves at night. Their earwigs are nocturnal. So that in, in, in the evening, they run up the trunks of trees and spend their night hunting around for prey on the leaves. And then at dawn, they scurry back down to ground level and hide up for the day somewhere where a bird won't eat them. Um, and it was, it was calculated quite recently that um, a healthy earwig population in an apple orchard does as much pest control as the farmer can achieve by spraying three separate times with insecticides. So the earwigs are saving the farmer quite a lot of money if he, if he looks after them. And yet, People still spray to kill earwigs. I, I was really alarmed that I went into um, one of the big um, garden center chains recently and uh, looked in horror at the, the array of pesticides on sale. And they still, they had bottles of bug killer spray with pictures of the different insects you might like to kill on the side and including pictures of earwigs, which is just madness. We should be looking after them now and trying to kill them. Anyway, they're also quite fascinating little beasties um, they're one of quite a rare in being insects that look after their offspring. They show parental care. Um, so this is a female earwig guarding her little nest um, full of eggs and newly hatched little nymphs there you can see. And she looks after them, she guards them, she feeds them. 
um, until they're about half grown and then she shoes them out of the out of the nest um, at which point if they don't go she eats them so she's not a perfect mother but nonetheless uh, lovely little creatures and we should we should cherish them not try and kill them of course the thing that insects do for us and for the environment that's probably best understood and recognized by the general populace is, is pollination. Um, uh, and Ian touched on this. Um, so 87% of all the plant species on the planet need pollinating by some kind of animal, not necessarily an insect. In, in the tropics, it might be a hummingbird or a bat or even a lizard in one or two obscure cases. But usually, and invariably in Europe, it's an insect of one type or another. But it isn't always a bee, and this is an important um, point to make. Um, it's, it's someone recently calculated that there are at least 4,000 species of um, pollinating insect just in the United Kingdom. Um, so that includes all of the bees, but also butterflies and moths and lots of different species of fly and wasp and beetle and so on, all busy visiting flowers, transferring pollen. And without them, most of our wildflowers would disappear because of course they wouldn't set any seed. And then from a human perspective, um, three quarters of the crops we grow need pollinating by insects of one type or another. Uh, so we've become used to our supermarkets being being replete with this amazing array of fruits and vegetables from all over the world, available 12 months of the, of the year. Um, it, things, if, if we didn't have insects, things wouldn't look so good. Um, uh, most of the fruits and vegetables just wouldn't be there or would be far less abundant. And we wouldn't have apples or cherries or strawberries or blueberries or raspberries or tomatoes, chili peppers, pumpkins, squashes, courgettes, even things like coffee and chocolate all depend upon insect pollinators. So um, life would be pretty difficult without them. Um, and the, 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 the truth is people would starve if we didn't have pollinators. So we need to really avoid ending up like, like these people who, um, they might look very happy, they're smiling away in their traditional dress, um, but what they're doing is quite kind of chilling when you know what it is, which is that they're, they're hand pollinating their flowers. This, these pictures are taken in Southwest China where there's a, a very large area of apple and pear orchards um, where there are now so few insects that, that they don't get a, a good harvest unless they hand pollinate. And they send their kids climbing up to, to do the higher flowers and so on. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine farmers in Europe, for example, hand pollinating their fields of oilseed rape. So we need to make sure this doesn't happen here or ideally anywhere else. So that was all a bit doom and gloom, isn't it? Let's move on to the more cheerful stuff. And there is a good, a positive spin to be found here. Um, because unlike, many, you know, many of these big environmental issues, we feel completely helpless, don't we? You know, what can you do about? I, I, I watched the, you know, the news coverage last summer of the Amazon burning. And, and you just, it's heartbreaking to watch and you feel completely helpless. What on earth can I do about that? Or the ice caps melting or whatever. Um, but insects live all around us and we can all get involved in, in looking after them. And what's more, most of them haven't gone extinct yet and they can recover really quickly, unlike rhinos or tigers or whatever. Re insect populations can bounce back really fast if we just provide them with the right conditions. And we can all get involved in doing that in our gardens, in our backyards, by badgering the local council to change the way they manage parks and so on. So that's what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of this talk is how we can make our gardens and our urban areas more wildlife friendly, more insect friendly. And I think there's a really exciting opportunity here because um, that, well, there are about 22 million gardens in the United Kingdom um, covering an area of about 400,000 hectares, which is a, a bigger area than all of the nature reserves in Britain put together. Um, and that's without counting all the other kind of urban green space, the parks, the cemeteries, the road verges, the roundabouts, which could also be managed 
to encourage insects and flowers and birds and so on. And if they were, just imagine if we could get most people's gardens uh, wildlife friendly and we could get most councils on board with the way they manage their, the, 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 the land that they own, then you've got a national network um, of, of insect friendly habitat. And that could really make a, a, a significant difference for, for, for wildlife. Um, and it, this is already happening. So the, the, the thing for me that gets me really excited is that this is kind of like an open door. There are people already making their gardens wildlife friendly. There are councils beginning to prick up their ears and realize they don't need to mow the road verges eight times a year and, and so on and so on. And I think we just need to push it along as fast as we can because um, within a, a short space of time, we really can make a huge change, I think. As you can tell, I'm quite enthusiastic about this. So I've, I've written a number of books, the two most recent ones, The Garden Jungle is all about kind of rewilding your garden and all the creatures that live in urban spaces. Um, and Gardening for Bumblebees is more of a kind of practical manual. It only came out in, uh, in this month. Um, it's a kind of how to make your garden into a, a paradise for pollinators, as it says on the cover. Um, so everyone, of course, you, you, we think of gardening as a green activity. What could be more green than growing fruits and vegetables and, and flowers in your garden? But actually, it isn't necessarily a green activity at all. The devil's kind of in the detail. It, it really depends how you garden. So if your idea of gardening is to jump in the car at the weekend and drive to your local garden centre, um, some big out of town edifice, and you get a trolley and you fill it with annual bedding plants um, grown in peat-based compost in disposable plastic pots, probably sprayed with lots of pesticides, um, and you get a sack of peat-based compost and perhaps some weed killer and some bug spray and some fertiliser and you will it all off to the till. Well, obviously there's nothing terribly green there. You've just had a huge impact on the planet and it's not a positive one, I'm afraid. Um, so it really depends how you do it. At its worst, gardens are actually really bad for the environment. Um, and this is a real garden. Uh, there are gardens like this. Some people's idea of a garden is to cover it in plastic grass, which is what this is, or to deck the whole thing or hard pave it or whatever. Um, this kind of garden has nothing but negative impacts. Um, but on the other hand, gardens can be amazingly rich in wildlife. And there's no better example of that than um, a garden in Leicester. So there's a, there's a book written by a lady called Jenny Owen, um, who rather obsessively spent 35 years um, identifying every single creature she could find in her tiny little urban Leicester garden. It was, I, I say tiny, it was 0 0.07 of a hectare. So what's that, about an eighth of an acre, I think. So it's pretty small, not minuscule, but a, a small urban garden, nothing special at all. But in th after 35 years of hunting in her garden, um, she'd managed to identify 2,673 different species of animals and plants, of which 1,997 were different types of insects. And I think, just think that's extraordinary that so much life can live in our, in our gardens, all around us, in our cities. Um, thousands and thousands of species. And all, she didn't do anything amazing to her garden. She had some, some pollinator friendly flowers, some native plants, a shrub or two, a pond, didn't use pesticides. Nothing that we couldn't all do really easily. So how can you make your garden into a, a paradise for pollinators? Well, I guess the first thing that springs to mind is what plants should, should we grow in our gardens? And actually, this is, this is a, a bit of a thorny issue because there are so many to choose from. As you can see there, um, I read a, a recent estimate that there are no less than about 70,000 different cultivars, varieties, species of plants available in UK garden centres. So, so where do you start? You know, it's, it's just an astonishing diversity, a real luxury to have so much available to us. Um, but it's rather bewildering. But there are a few kind of rules of thumb that can help you on your way. Firstly, 
Um, avoid double varieties. Hundreds of the plants on sale in garden centers are double varieties, which are all mutants of the wild kind of type flower or the simpler flower. Um, so these are a few examples here, roses, cherries, hollyhocks, but there are many, many more. And the, the, the kind of natural version is along the bottom and the double variety along the top. And so those double varieties are actually mutants. They're mutants in which the, the anthers that produce the pollen have mutated into extra petals. So if you look at the rose, the one bottom left, bees, bees love those. The little dark orange spots are the anthers uh, which are producing the pollen. Um, but in the one above it, the, it's commonly called a, a hybrid tea rose or sort of the standard rose you might give someone on Valentine's Day. Um, those anthers have mutated into, into petals, so there is no pollen. Um, and there may be a bit of nectar in the middle, but bees can't get to it because of all the petals in the way. So they're pretty useless. Um, they, those, those type of roses from a bee's perspective are a disaster. Um, so there's a simple thing to remember, go for single varieties of flowers. I think they're prettier anyway, to be honest. Also generally avoid annual bedding plants, which most of which, not absolutely all, but the very large majority of which tend to be pretty rubbish too. Um, and it's, it, again, it's down to intensive breeding and cult in, in cultivation by people. Um, of course, all flowers evolved in the first place to be attractive to pollinators. That's why they have petals and scent. It's not to look nice or smell nice to us. It's to attract the pollinator so the plant can, can set seed. Um, but we've tinkered with plants over many generations, selecting for bigger blooms, longer blooming periods, different colors and so on. And that intensive breeding has often rendered the flowers of no interest to insects. They often produce no nectar or have no pollen or they're just a weird shape so insects can no longer get into them. And most annual bedding plants fall in that category. So if you could avoid the begonias, the busy lizzies, the petunias and so on, I'm really sorry if you've just filled a hanging basket with all of the above. Never mind, next year. Um, uh, and instead, as a general rule of thumb, head for biennials and perennials, um, traditional cottage garden kind of flowers. Herbs in particular tend to be good. But even then, you've still got thousands and thousands to choose from. So how do you narrow it down? Which ones are the, really the best ones for pollinators? Well, so to try and find this out, I teamed up with um, a nursery run by Rosie Rowlings. It's called Rosie Bee Nursery. It's in Oxfordshire, so not very handy for Sheffield. Um, but they do do plants by mail order, actually, should you be interested. Organic, peat free. I don't have any shares in the company. Um, but uh, Rosie is passionate about uh, looking after pollinators and she set up a, a kind of experiment in her nursery. She planted one meter squares of 111 different garden flowers, all ones of them which are recommended as being good for pollinators. And she carefully counted the number of insects visiting each flower through the spring and summer to work out which ones, when they're growing side by side in identical conditions, which ones actually attract the most insects. Um, you can read the paper, it's open access if you can be bothered to, to Google it. Um, although it's, it's a typical scientific paper, so it's a bit stodgy to read, but the basics of it are fairly easy to understand. Um, anyway, I'm gonna give you the, the kind of very brief highlights. So first of all, what were the winners? So I was quite surprised by by this, I must admit. Um, I've never even bothered to grow lesser calamint in my garden. It's, it's not the most spectacular plant you've ever seen. There it is, uh, bottom left. Um, but actually, in terms of the number of insect visits in a year, it was the best plant of, of, of all. Um, so worth trying to get hold of some. I've, in fact, just grown a load from seed, so I can see how good it is for myself. Um, second was Hellenium, the bright yellow daisy. And third were geraniums, hardy geraniums, in particular this variety, Razan, but most hardy geraniums are really good for bumblebees in particular, and, but they also get a range of other pollinators visiting them. So those were the top ones overall, but if you look at different insect groups, they have very different preferences. So my favorites are the bumblebees, 
And, you, and if you look at the top plants for bumblebees, they're a completely different selection to the ones we just looked at. Um, I won't talk you through all of these, but the absolute best flower of the 111 that Rosie grew for bumblebees was um, a, a native wildflower called Vipers bugloss or bugloss, um, which is actually a, a gorgeous flower to, to grow in your garden. It's one of my absolute favorites. It grows about a meter and a half tall. Beautiful purple spikes of flowers in, in midsummer. Um, and it just attracts clouds and clouds of bees because it produces so much nectar. Um, but there are lots of others that are good for bees. Catmint is fantastic. Um, giant hyssop uh, on the right there is really good. Uh, lamb's ear is worth growing. It's not the most beautiful plant. This is, this is lamb's ear down the bottom. Um, but not only do bumblebees like the flowers, but it's also really attractive to wool carder bees, which are solitary bees. And the females like to collect the downy hairs off the leaves to take back to build their nests. Um, and I found if I grow this, I never used to have wall carder bees in my garden, but as soon as I started growing this plant, they magically appeared. So maybe they will for you too. One other result before I finish talking about that study, um, there's an interesting thing which has been found in other studies as well, which is that on average, native wildflowers did better than non-natives, um, than, than introduced ornamentals from elsewhere in the world. Um, uh, and this isn't perhaps surprising because of course, our native wildflowers have, have co-evolved over thousands of years with our, our pollinators. Um, so it's perhaps not surprising that our pollinators prefer them. Um, but the best native plants overall um, were marjoram on the left, uh, which is a fantastic plant to grow in the garden. You can use it in your cooking. It has a long flowering period. You can grow in a pot on a windowsill if you ha don't have an outdoor space. Um, and insects love it, all sorts of insects, not just bumblebees. Uh, you get butterflies and hoverflies and honeybees and so on. Uh, well worth squeezing into your garden somewhere. Now, now I'm talking about wildflowers. This kind of brings me on to, to an interesting topic, which is the subject of weeds. Uh, so when is a native wildflower a, a, a flower and when is it a, a weed? Um, it actually really just depends on your kind of point of view. We've slightly arbitrarily decided that some plants are undesirable. And we spend an awful lot of time trying to kill them um, I think mostly unnecessarily and, and would encourage you to, to at least try to be a little bit more tolerant of these really where if you if you try to be impartial dispassionate about it and sit back and look they're beautiful aren't they look at that those dandelions they're fantastic uh, spring flowers they're in flower at the moment and uh, they're a really valuable nectar resource for um, bumblebee queens that have come out of hibernation recently and are starving hungry and it just seems such a shame that we spend so much time trying to kill dandelions, spraying them with herbicides or digging them up by the roots or whatever. So, you know, if you can really bring yourself to the kind of Zen-like state of harmony with nature, you can, you can get rid of all the, all the weeds in your garden with a click of a finger just by calling them all wildflowers instead. Okay, one other way, or no, there's a couple more ways you can add flowers to your patch. Uh, one is by growing flowering trees, which are rarely mentioned in lists of pollinator friendly plants. But of course, many flowering trees are really attractive to, to pollinators. Um, there are all sorts to choose from. Um, probably the widest selection of the many different types of fruit trees you can grow, apples, cherries, plums, quinces, um, pears. They're all really attractive to insects. You know, this huge volume of blossom, which is excitingly just about to appear in my garden. They're not quite out yet. Um, and if you've got room for a tree, um, and bear in mind that even if you have a small garden, you can get fruit trees on dwarf rootstocks that can fit in quite small spaces, even some apples that will live happily in a pot on a, on a terrace or a patio. Um, if you do have room for a fruit tree, then you're providing lots of food in spring for bees and in return they'll pollinate the flowers and you'll get your own zero food miles fruit later in the year. Isn't that wonderful? Um, and at the same time, as, it tree, as the tree grows, it's locking up carbon. So winds all round. Everyone should try and squeeze in a fruit tree. Actually, on the subject of which, I'd love it if 
councils planted more fruit trees in towns, in the streets, in, in the parks, so that people could just go and pick their own fruit. Um, children could pick fruit on the way into school. Wouldn't that be cool? Okay. The other simple way to add flowers to your garden, if you've got a lawn, is to just stop mowing, or at least reduce the frequency of mowing. It's a, it's a bit of an English trait to kind of be obsessed by a neat lawn. Um, and uh, my dad does this, he's, he's in his 80s, but he still obsessively mows every couple of weeks and tries to get straight lines up and down his lawn. Um, but it isn't really necessary to do that. And it's really disastrous for wildlife. A close mown lawn supports very little life. But if you just stop for a few weeks, it's amazing how many flowers will appear in most lawns, particularly if they're older lawns that have been there for a while. So this is my lawn. And I've never sown any wildflower seeds or done anything to it, um, other than I don't mow very often. And you can see how many flowers there are, red clover, white clover, buttercups, dandelions, daisies, the self-heal, the speedwell, there's all sorts of lovely flowers which attract a whole host of insects. And it's so easy, I'm just, I'm saving myself labor, I'm saving petrol. So next time you get the urge to, to get the mower out and you, you think the lawn's getting a bit shaggy, um, just try and kind of restrain yourself and instead get the deck chair out and make yourself a coffee or a gin and tonic and sit down and relax and, and enjoy the bees. Of course, it's not just our gardens that are mown too often. I've already touched on this, uh, as did Ian. Um, the council owns a lot of land and most councils send teams of, of men out, or sometimes women of either gender, to, to mow away um, using lots of petrol and wasting an awful lot of, of taxpayers' money um, for no obvious purpose at all, other than we have this, uh, some people think that verges ought to be mowed, uh, that parks need to be mowed all the time. Um, it's what we've become used to, and some people think it's untidy if they're not mowed all the time, but it's a huge improvement for wildlife. So this is actually not just a result of not mowing, this is, this is a verge that used to be a boring mown verge, um, but it's been commandeered by a little, um, a little group that call themselves On The Verge. Um, if this picture was actually taken, I took it up in Stirling in Scotland, which is a small city where I used to work, um, where there's this, this, this little group of volunteers, there's only 30 or so of them, um, and they spend their weekends digging over any bit of grassland that they can get their hands on and sowing it with wildflowers. And at the last count, there were 93 different patches like this dotted around Stirling. That's a, a road verge, obviously. There's a roundabout. Um, but they've also got patches of flowers like this in, in parks, in a, a primary school field, uh, next to a rugby pitch, uh, even in a prison. Um, they're everywhere as you drive around Stirling. And it, wouldn't it be fantastic if every roundabout in Britain, if every road verge looked like that? That could make a huge difference for wildlife. Instead, um, what you often see are things like this, when it, which just makes me so sad. Why? Why was that necessary? Um, I, I'm sure you can all guess what this is. So this was a little, little patch of green clinging onto life in, amongst the tarmac um, around the base of a silver birch tree. It was probably just grass. It wouldn't have supported much in the way of insect life, but there might have been a few things there. But now it's dead, it's been sprayed with herbicide and this is such a common sight in our streets. Many councils employ people with either backpack sprayers or on quad bikes with tanks on the back full of herbicide that drive around the streets and if they see anything green they kill it. What on earth are we doing? It's mad. Um, so please, please stop doing that um, if there's anyone from a local council listening in. Um, it's just not necessary. And also it's potentially harmful to people and our pets and so on, because the chemical that's usually used is, um, is Roundup, which has the active ingredient glyphosate. And there's an, a, a pretty strong body of evidence suggesting that glyphosate is a carcinogen. It causes cancer in humans. Um, and yet we're spraying it on our, on our pavements, um, in our parks, along the paths, around the playgrounds and so on. It's absolutely nuts. We should stop immediately, I think.
I'm quite outspoken on this subject and, and would ban all pesticides in gardens and in towns. Um, and that may sound good to some people to be a bit extreme, but France have actually already done this. They did it um, 18 months ago. They, they introduced a law whereby now um, only licensed farmers can buy pesticides. So the local council can't buy pesticides, even if they want to. And gardeners can't buy pesticides, only farmers. So by default, every city in France is now pesticide free, um, which is fantastic. And if France can do it, why can't everywhere do it? Why can't we do it? Um, there are lots of other uh, cities around the world that have unilaterally gone pesticide free, just very few in Britain so far, but isn't it about time we caught up, I think. So if you're a gardener right now thinking, but what do I do about the aphids on my roses or runner beans or, or broad beans or whatever? Um, uh, I would say this, just don't do anything, leave them be. And I find in my garden that usually within a few days, a whole army of little predators comes along and wipes them out for me without having to use any chemicals at all. Um, just occasionally, this doesn't happen, and I've had one or two bean crops that have been a bit undersized because of an outbreak of aphids. But is that such a bad thing? I get a few less runner beans, but at least they haven't been sprayed with poison. It seems to me a better way to go than spending money on, on bottles of bug spray, which I then spray all over something I'm planning to eat. I think it's madness. Okay, so possibly some of you listening are organic gardeners. I would guess probably quite a few of you are. You wouldn't dream of spraying pesticides in your garden like me. Um, but there are a couple of other ways you might accidentally bring pesticides into your garden that I, I should warn you about. The first is this one. Um, so we did some uh, work recently on the pesticides in garden center plants. Um, we uh, drove around buying plants from all the big name garden centers, places like B&Q and Homebase and Yvale and so on. And we screened the pollen and the nectar of these plants for pesticides. We specifically bought plants that were badged as being perfect for pollinators or bee friendly. And you're not going to be totally surprised to hear that 98% of them contained at least one pesticide. Some of them contained as many as 10 different pesticides. 75% contained insecticides. 70% um, contained things called neonicotinoid insecticides, which um, Ian had a brave attempt to pronounce earlier, neonics. Um, uh, so these are, this is outrageous that garden centers are selling plants as bee friendly when they're full of pesticides. So, should, so do be aware of, of that. If you can find an organic nursery, or otherwise grow from seed, it's a much better option. So that's one thing to be aware of. The other one is this, uh, and this might seem somewhat tangential, but bear with me. Um, so many of us, of nat and many nature lovers, have a pet or two, uh, a dog, a cat. And if you do, and you go to the vet, the vet will advise you to treat it against fleas. Prophylactically, most vets will advise you to treat your animal, even if it hasn't got fleas. And the commonest way to treat them is by a, by a spot on treatment, which you drip on the neck of the animal once a month. Um, now, this one on the left, um, Advocate, its active ingredient is in tiny font, it's imidacloprid. That is in fact a neonicotinoid insecticide. Um, the other one, um, Frontline, uses something called fipronil, which is a very similar chemical. Incredibly toxic to all insects. Um, the dose of, of advocate that you're supposed to drip on your dog every month is enough to kill 60 million honeybees. And these chemicals are quite persistent. They last for months um, and they're water soluble. So if the dog has a swim in the canal or a river or your garden pond or goes out in the rain and then shakes itself, it's spraying insecticide all over your garden without your even knowing it, um, which is something you should be aware of. What's more, uh, we just published a paper in February this year showing that these products uh, are detectable in our rivers, and both of them are turning up very regularly at levels in English rivers that exceed the safe limits for insect life, and uh, hence are probably contributing to the declines of all the many aquatic insects that live in our freshwater systems, which is rather sad and is something we should try and do something about. 
Okay, back to more positive things we can do in our gardens. Just to finish off, a few finishing touches to the perfect bee-friendly, uh, pollinator-friendly garden. Why not have a bee hotel? Um, everybody's heard of bee hotels. I guess they're intended to provide homes not for bumblebees or honeybees, but for solitary bees, which actually make up the majority of British species. Bees in which the female bee just makes a nest on her own, single-handed. And many of them like to nest in little tunnels and it's really easy to provide them. Um, this ugly fence post here is one I just drilled some holes in um, one spring, uh, about four years ago now. Um, eight millimeter holes about right. And within 20 minutes, I had my first red mason bee here coming to investigate. Um, gorgeous little bees, they're just coming out of hibernation now. Um, and they nested in most of the holes and I've got a big colony in there now. Any holes that are unoccupied uh, but in summer get occupied by these uh, creatures. These are leaf cutter bees, which are named because they like to snip little semicircles of leaf and carry them back to their hole. And they use them to line the hole, tying them together with silk, and then they fill it with pollen and lay their eggs. Glorious little creatures. Of course, you can make much more attractive bee hotels than that. Um, either have a neat block of wood and drill some neat holes in it, um, or you can use bamboo cane or whatever. Fun projects you can do at the weekend, do it with kids or grandkids or whatever. See what you can come up with. Um, the bees aren't too fussy at all. Uh, many of these designs will, will work. Or if you're absolutely hopeless at DIY, then go down um, the bought route and there are lots of commercial designs. This is one of my favorites. It's, um, it's not the cheapest, I must admit, but it's from a company called uh, Nurturing Nature. You can find them online. And the reason it's nice is because it has a window on the side. Most bee hotels, you can never see what's happening inside. But with this one, you can take that little sort of door off and you can see this view here on the right of, of the bees offspring. So these, these are the offspring of the red mason bees. And you can see the bright yellow pollen that the mum collected and these comma shaped fat grubs developing, eating the pollen. The reason they call mason bees is because the mother makes little walls of clay to separate out each of her offspring. My, my kids, when they were younger, really loved watching this. Uh, I could highly recommend, if you've got children, get, getting a bee hotel with a window. Okay, so that's one way to provide habit, a little sort of breeding ground for some insects. Um, another, which is much less well known, is you might make a hoverfly lagoon, which is a... Um, a breeding habitat for some species of hoverfly, like these rather handsome ones on the right there, that like to lay their eggs in, um, in, in uh, small puddles. Uh, and it's really easy to create habitat for them, any kind of little waterproof container. You can see some pretty messy examples of mine. Um, fill it up with water, chuck in some leaves or uh, lawn clippings. And with a bit of luck, they, these work really reliably within a few days you'll get flies laying eggs, which hatch into these magnificent creatures at the top. Uh, unfortunately, the common English name doesn't do them any great favors. Um, they're known as rat-tailed maggots, which doesn't really sell them to people. Um, but they're actually really fascinating. The tail is a snorkel. So they'd get eaten by birds if they hung around near the surface of the water. There'd be a lovely snack. So they live as deep as they can get. Um, and their tail can stretch to at least a couple of inches long. Uh, and it's, so it's, it's just a breathing tube, a snorkel that they send up to the surface. Really cool little things. Um, again, kids have a lot of fun looking for them in their hoverfly lagoon. And then finally, seeing as I bigged up how important earwigs are, why not make an earwig hotel? If you've got a fruit tree, a pot stuffed full of straw tied to the top of the trunk provides the perfect sort of um, daytime accommodation for your earwigs that will spend their nights eating all the pests on the leaves for you. Okay, so there you go. If you do all of those things, then you can turn your own garden into a, a mini sanctuary for, for insect life and for wildlife in general. And I, I would urge you to, to do something, to, to join me in trying to help because we really are, to come back to this point I made at the beginning, we're doing a lot of damage to our planet and it really worries me that I, you know, we would all do anything, wouldn't we, for our children or our grandchildren apart from, it seems, leave them a decent planet to live on. It's completely nuts. But what better place to start looking after 
uh, nature than in our own back gardens and by looking after the little creatures that live all around us. Okay, thank you very much everybody for listening. Um, I will just unshare the screen and if you have questions, please type them in. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for that. Really interesting, really informative. Um, I'm sure everyone agrees. Um, thank you very much for the questions and the discussions that have been happening in the chat. Um, I'll go through now and read out some of the questions. So um, if you have one or two, please pop them in and um, we'll try everything. So the first question um, refers uh, back to one of the slides in your presentation. Um, and I guess the, the person who asked it can step in if, um, if you need more expl explanation. But does the 1.5 million species include the bacteria and viruses? <laughs> Well, so it's really difficult to, with bacteria and viruses, they don't really fit the concept of a species at all because they, they exchange genetic information in a way that the higher organisms don't. So it's really hard to even define what a species is with these little microbes. So not really, no. And there's probably an extraordinary diversity of little creatures um, that we've yet to discover, but you can't really count them in terms of number of species because they work like that. Um, but it's a, it's a really good point. There is probably an amazing diversity there that's uh, waiting to be investigated. Are non-native insect species um, thriving and arriving in UK gardens a good thing? Um, well, that's an interesting question. Um, there have been a, a lot of insect invasions, some seemingly benign, some um, not so benign. Um, so, uh, for example, on, on the positive side, um, the tree bumblebee is one of the few bumblebee success stories in the United Kingdom in recent years. Um, we don't know how it got here from France, but it somehow hopped the channel uh, and was first, first caught in 2001 on the south coast of England by me, actually. Uh, but. Uh, um, but it's since become a common bee and you get the, they've reached Scotland. Um, and as far as anyone can tell, it's not doing any harm at all. Um, uh, and it's nice that at least one species is increasing in numbers. Um, so there's a, there's a nice positive example, but then just a couple of negatives. The Harlequin ladybird is an Asian ladybird species, which is invasive all over the world and eats most of our other ladybirds along with a load of other things. And is having quite a negative impact. Um, and at the moment, there's, this, there's a lot of panic amongst beekeepers about the Asian hornet, which is attempting to cross the channel kind of almost as we speak there. Um, they were accidentally introduced from China to France um, some years ago, and they've spread all over Europe, and their favourite food is honeybees. They will also eat wild bumblebees too, uh, and so everyone's a bit worried about And there's a big um, campaign to try and spot them and eradicate them as soon as they cross, but uh, whether it will succeed, time will tell. So it really depends on the insect is, is the answer. Thank you. Um, if a million of species of insects are, sent, are essential for much of the planet's higher animals, why was the insect number decline discovered before the impact on birds, animals, which are more visible? Why was it discovered before? So well, before why wasn't it discovered before? Yeah. Because people pay no attention to insects. Um, you know, the, the, the people are much more drawn to big, charismatic, colorful creatures. Um, you know, I mentioned pandas and tigers and so on. The number of people that study or count um, insects is tiny. Um, uh, so we just, just had, far less information about what was happening with them until quite recently. And even now, um, there are some incredible knowledge gaps um, about what's really happening with our insects. So for example, um, we don't have any long-term sort of monitoring studies at all on any insect group in the whole of Africa or South America, um, where two, two continents which probably have extraordinary diversity of interesting insects, and we don't know anything about what's happening to them, um, which is kind of worrying. So, but yeah, it just reflects a, a sort of, I think it's a kind of a, one of those innate biases towards big kind of cuddly things and 
and most people pay zero attention to insects, sadly. Thank you. Uh, which wildflowers uh, do best in rich virgin soil and resist the regrowth of the grass if you turn over? Which wildflowers do best in rich soil? Well, that's a real problem, actually, because not many. Um, uh, the, the, one of the big problems, the big drivers of, of the loss of flowers from the countryside is the high levels of fertility um, because of fertilizer applications um, on farmers' fields, which often leach into hedgerows and field margins and rivers and so on. And in high, highly fertile soils, you tend to get docks, nettles, coarse grasses. One or two plants thrive. Hogweed is one of the few wild flowers that can, can thrive in those conditions. But the large majority of our, of our native wildflowers just get squeezed out because they're not adapted to those conditions. Um, so if you, if you want to create a, you know, your own wildflower meadow or restore one of our beautiful uh, hay meadows or whatever, then, then finding somewhere with low fertility or trying to reduce the fertility is one of the kind of first steps you have to take. Um, so so it, it's, yeah, there's no simple solution to that. Of course, in a garden setting, high fertility is fine because you can manage, you know, you can exert some control. You can get rid of the nettles or the docks um, by just digging them out and then you, you know, other plants will then grow beautifully in highly fertile soil. They just can't compete in highly fertile soil. Thank you. And um, would a hoverfly lagoon attract mosquitoes? It might. That's a horrible thing to admit, but yes, um, not many I, I find and I don't, I've never had any problem, um, but you do sometimes see mosquito larvae in them. Um, so if you're really worried about that, then um, don't make one. Thank you. And uh, what trees should we plant that can cope with climate change uh, over the next 50 years? Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. Um, I'm not, I mean, the obvious solution is, is to look to slightly warmer climates, um, you know, France or whatever, um, and see what thrives there. Um, because our climate's going to be sort of essentially be similar to somewhere that's two or three hundred miles further south in the future. Um, but I, off the top of my head, I'm afraid I don't know which which species would be optimal. Um, but um, I, I'm sure cleverer people than I that are experts in trees have made some recommendations. Sorry, I'm going to have to pass on the detail on that one. That's fine, thank you. And you might not know, so um, I will ask that if any of our audience have any ideas to the answer to this question as well and can recommend, but someone asked, do you have recommendations for, uh, for anti-secticide free flea treatments for pets? I know you mentioned yeah, in the presentation. I, I, I'm sure. Any. Yeah, so, so first of all, um, I don't, you don't treat the animal if it doesn't have fleas. Um, Despite what your vet says, I've talked to lots of vets about this and many of them ad admit that actually there isn't a strong case for using them prophylactically. It's like using antibiotics to prevent getting ill rather than when you are ill. Um, it's, it's, it, and the majority of animals don't have fleas most of the time, especially in winter, for example, when it's colder. So that number one is don't treat unless you have to. Number two is wash the bed regularly um, and hoover under it because the larval fleas don't live on the animal, they live in the bedding and you can kill them and get rid of them. Um, so that can often prevent a problem in the first place. Um, but then if, uh, an, oh, another preventative measure, which some people swear by, I've never tried myself, is you can get herbal diets. There's, there's one which I'm told works, but I can't verify, which has the kind of silly name, Billy Nomates. Um, but you can find it really easily. Um, and it's said to make the dog or cat, you know, unattractive to fleas. Um, if all of that fails, then um, the consensus seems to be that oral tablet treatment, you can get insecticides that you feed to the dog or cat rather than dripping on them. And they probably are better for the environment, but we're not really certain of that because they haven't been investigated that much. The commonest brand is called Brevecto, um, which is based on a, pro a, a chemical called fluorolana. Um, it still comes out of the animal in its poo and its wee, and it's still toxic to insects. Um, so it's not ideal. 
and if you can avoid using it, please do. Is there any other ideas out there? I'm very delighted to hear them. Thank you. Um, we have one um, statement that someone would like you to comment on. Uh, can you comment on the idea that some have for humans to get a significant part of their diet from insects? Indigenous people do this in several parts of the world. Is it feasible in the UK or will it be industrial food? Uh, well, it's, it's certainly an interesting idea that we probably shouldn't dismiss out of hand. Um, uh, insects, I mean, so roughly 80% of the world's human population do regularly eat insects. It's only in Europe and North America that it's considered a bit weird, it's sort of taboo for some reason, which is odd when you think about it, because we happily eat shrimps, which are, you know, related arthropods with lots of legs and everything, and yet we think that they look edible, but we don't like the idea of eating a locust for some reason. Anyway, um, they are very nutritious. Uh, they're quite, they're much more efficient than livestock such as chickens or cows or pigs in converting animal material into animal protein and fat that's easily digested by us. Um, uh, so there are, uh, you know, things to be said for it. Although I, I'm also inclined to think that actually it's, they may be more efficient than than chickens, but they're, they're not as efficient as eating the plant material directly. And I think the, the bigger answer to, or one of the biggest things we need to face up to is we should eat less meat. Um, now, whether you replace some of that with insects or you replace it with soybeans um, is up to you. Um, but I think in terms of environmental impact, probably the soybeans would be lower uh, rather than growing something like soybeans and then feeding them to crickets and then eating the crickets. Um, but they could certainly be part of the mix. I mean, you can't, there are some insects that will eat things which have no nutritional value whatsoever for humans and turn them into something that we can eat. Um, but my only issue is actually, I've yet to find any insect based food that I actually liked eating really. Chocolate covered ants is the nearest I've come, but I'm pretty sure that was the chocolate and not the ant, but. Uh... <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, we'll, we'll do a couple more questions. So um, just to say, Hey, thank you to everyone for, for writing your questions. We won't take any, any further questions, but I'll just finish the ones we have. Um, so um, what about beetles? You did not mention the importance of deadwood, both in pals and the standing ditch. No, sorry, you could, there's so many. I didn't talk about ponds either. Um, I have both things that every good wildlife garden should have. Beetles are great and there are extraordinary numbers of them, one of the most diverse groups on the planet. And I barely gave them a mention other than saying that some are pollinators. And yeah, de the deadwood is a habitat that um, is, is in short supply because we, we are far too tidy with our woodlands these days, or we certainly have been until recently. And there's a, there are hundreds of species of insect associated with rotting wood um, that, are, that are missing out on habitat because we tidy up our woodlands and any bit of timber that falls to the ground tends to get chainsawed up and stuck in someone's log burner these days. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I, whoever said that. Very good point. We should all make piles of dead wood in the garden and look out for beetles. Thank you. Um, another question. My dogs have dug up my lawn. Is there any hardy bush or other plant or seed that I could plant? That dogs won't dig up? Um, hang on, sorry. In, to replace a lawn or or to replace a shrub? Um, yeah. They said uh, to replace the lawn or something more hardy. I, I suppose that the, the dog won't dig up. Well, I, I mean, not, there are lots of lots of shrubs that one could plant, um, uh, and you know why not go for some native shrubs? Uh, uh, plant some flowering hawthorn. You get some lovely hawthorns, of various different colours. Um, blackthorns, lovely wayfaring tree is very nice. I don't think dogs are going to dig up any of those. Um, but whether they want to replace their lawn with a shrubbery, I'm I'm not clear. Thank you. Uh, and uh, might there be a linkage between the falling numbers of insects generally and falling numbers of hedgehogs, which tend to eat a lot of insects like beetles? Yeah, I'm not an expert on hedgehogs, but it seems logical. I, I, hedgehogs do eat a lot of grubs of insects, you know, caterpillars and beetle larvae and so on. Um, and, you know, the decline of insects is, uh, is likely to be contributing to hedgehog declines. But I think there are probably other factors too impacting on hedgehogs, um, but they're sadly not my area of expertise. 
would I still be at risk? risk of accidentally exposing bees to pesticide if I buy and grow seed mixtures instead of full grown plants at the garden centre? No, I think that's fine. Um, so uh, even if even if the parent plant the seed came from was treated, the seed wouldn't have much pesticide in it. And by the time it's grown into a full sized plant and is flowering itself, any pesticide residues will be negligible. I should stress that that's very different to the situation where farmers buy seeds that have actually been coated in, in insecticide deliberately um, and then the whole plant does it become impregnated with enough pesticide to, to make it toxic if a bee visits it. But if it's just the residues left on the seed accidentally, uh, it'll be fine. Thank you. And final question for you, you uh, Dave. Uh, what recommendations do you have for people, people who don't have their own gardens? Yeah, well, I mean, if, if you've got a, a balcony, a window box, then grow some herbs, some marjoram, some thyme, some rosemary, some sage. They're all nice flowers for pollinators and good for cooking too, so kind of dual purpose. Um, or get involved in, in local campaigns to make your area pesticide free, to plant flowers in the, in the parks. I mentioned the On The Verge group, um, based in Stirling, but they're not actually based in Stirling anymore because they, well, they are, but uh, they've sp spawned sister groups in one in Cambridge and there's one in Brighton. So why not one in Sheffield? Wouldn't that be great? You could start your own on the verge uh, branch and plant wildflowers over or, or everywhere you can get your hands on. Um, so that would be great. Go for it. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. I'm just going to ask one quick question to Ian and then, uh, and then we'll wrap up. So Ian, if you are ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ian, okay, thank you. So um, are Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust talking to the city councils about herbicides and pesticides? And if so, how is the discussion going? Yeah, um, yeah, we have had discussions with them um, and we've looked into the issue, which we know that are also concerns for them. Um, part of uh, the issue to give a bit of balance on that is that they do obviously get a lot of complaints from people uh, when things get a bit overgrown. There are also safety issues for them when that happens. Um, so that's one of the concerns with, with verges. Um, we do know that Sheffield, um, I, I know that Sheffield, I'm sure Rotherham will be looking into it and probably trialling it as well, but Sheffield have been trialling um, alternatives to pesticides. And um, they're, I think they're still uh, looking at the results of those because they need to obviously find out um, how effective it will be uh, as an alternative. But in fairness, we do know that they're doing that. But it is an issue um, that we're looking at. It is an issue as part of the Action for Insects campaign um, to take on with councils. So it is one that we'll continue to look at and question and, and, and see what can be done. Um, there is some information um, about this on the Action for Insects campaign, so do have a look at that uh, if, you, if you want to find out more. Okay, thank you very much. So um, that, that's all of our questions. Um, so thank you to everyone who asked questions um, this evening, who, who inputted uh, into the chat and, to, and had the discussions. Um, thank you to everyone who donated to attend the event. We've raised over £900 in ticket donations. And as a charity, your support really does make a difference from protecting wildlife to helping people connect with nature uh, and each other. So every penny helps. So thank you so much. And if any of you out there um, aren't members of Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife and are interested in becoming members, as Ian spoke about in his presentation, we're actually offering an incredible insects bumper membership pack when you join. Um, we'll be emailing information um, to you about this if, if you are interested, and this will include a bee butterfly and beetle booklet, action for insect activity sheets, so you can get involved and do some of the spoken about tonight, and also uh, wildflower seed packs. And um, so we will email around with information about that. Um, so I'd like um, to, to finish off by saying a huge, huge thank you to Dave and to Ian. And if everyone wants to put their cameras on and give Dave a thank you and a round, round of applause, uh, we've loved having you in Sheffield and Rotherham so much. And that's everything from us. And we hope to see you at our events again in the future. Yes, thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank Take care. Bye, thank you. Thank you.
Thanks. Thanks very much.